I'm trying to help people out by doing these videos. I'm trying to help them become better prepared to, be, to enable themselves to go out and approach people of various walk, walks of life and say, I want to have this meaningful discussion and not get into a situation of, of, of contentious, contentious argument. I don't want people to be in the church. I like the fact that the less people that are in, in God's kingdom, the more chance that I get to be with him personally than by myself. <laughs> you know? So I have, I, I'm very selfish and I'm jealous of everybody else, okay? So hey, Mormon. Hey, Mormon. Hey, what you doing, you Mormon? Your church Mormon. Cult? Mormon. Your church you hell, Mormon. Mormon. Hey, Mormon. Bible Get tells me you're going to hell, Mormon. Get out of my face, you Mormon. I have been called a Mormon. I have been called a Christian. I am not a Mormon. I am not a Christian. I am a child of God, and my master is Jesus Christ. I am a Latter-day Saint on fire. Okay. Well, we got Eric back on the line here. Uh, we were having a discussion about uh, uh, debating and um, in our priesthood quorum today. And uh, I felt like people were kind of like avoiding uh, opportunities to have discussions uh, because it might turn into a debate. And uh, Eric could uh, said, AJ, you probably don't have debates. You probably have, what do you call it? Uh, dialogues. Yeah. Dialogue, dialogue. And, and, and sometimes those, uh, those discussions uh, can become contentious at times. Is that right? Well, I think if you've gotten to contention, you've, you've abandoned the dialogue. But th there can be conflict within dialogue and even some, you know, sincere, strong emotion, right? Right. Because if you, if you don't have conviction, then what you have is two people just um, not really engaging anything deep about whatever subject. And we do this because we're, re we're religious. We are, we've uh, basically uh, patterned our lives after the manner of Christ who uh, set some guidelines in our lives that we really enjoy. We think that are valuable to society. And when we see opportunities uh, to engage in conversation, we do so, at least I do so, because I can't wait. I can't wait to have that, that uh, discussion about, about uh, living life in a manner that makes us successful. And, <clears throat> and, if, you, and if you only pick and choose those people that you'll have dialogue with, because you think there's going to be some contentious or some kind of uh, so strong emotion on one side or the other, then I think from my perspective, you almost stop having any dialogue with anybody because you're afraid of that moment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there certainly can be... Uh... There can be cowardice masquerading as peacemaking, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, which is sort of conflict avoidance, right? But um, I and it's certainly very natural. I do it sometimes too. But I don't see the savior as one who avoided conflict. He just never got trapped into contention. Um, and those are different things, I think, anyway. Yeah, that, so when we have um, a difference of opinion, and me and you have difference of opinions on, on different things that we, we've studied, we've, we've talked about the, um, the prodigal son, and we've 
had that discussion and how we differ yeah. in those things. Uh, and we were very passionate about our, what we feel is um, what we like about that story that reflects it into us as a human being. And we don't, even though during that discussion, we had debate or we had dialogue that we did not agree on, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the, but is it possible to have that same dialogue with those who would be uh, outside of the church, even contentious with the church? Um. Yes, I, I say yes, but um, it depends, right? It depends on what the intention is. I, I was just reading today a philosopher, Alicia Horero, I think is her name. Probably didn't pronounce that correctly, but um, she did. She's done some, from my layman's perspective, some really interesting work in, in action theory and purposeful or intentional behavior versus unintentional behavior. Right? And to put it simply, she says, what's the difference between a wink and a blink, right? Uh, and we all recognize that difference. So, um, and yet describing it, creating a theory of it is, is non-trivial. It's hard to do. So I guess what I would say is, it depends on the purpose of the conversation, right? And I, I have people that I have really cool conversations with who I know are pretty devoted atheists, right? Um, that doesn't trouble me. Um, I don't feel like they're coming from a place of trying to convert me to their atheism nor I to trying to convert them to my view of, uh, of Christ. Um, in that context, we understand that the game we are playing, if you will, and I'm not using game in a cynical sense, right? Uh, but the language game, the, the interaction that we're engaged in is, it's going to be limited. I can't share some of the experiences that I have with them because they, they don't consider them valid moves in the game. And some of their moves that might be perfectly valuable in the game with some of their other atheist friends, uh, I reject as legitimate moves, right, in the game. But even within that difference, there is a shared sphere of respect for reality and the role of reason and the role of logic uh, and self-honesty and criticality of oneself first and foremost right understanding that we are capable of deceiving ourselves so we share some of those values but you know to the extent that our values don't overlap we run into places where by definition almost we can't come to resolution because we don't have a set of values towards which we're aiming so you know I certainly wouldn't be interested in uh, a conversation in which I was trying to prove the existence of God to them. I take as a given that because I've had experience with his spirit, you know, for me, he's part of my reality. I don't need to prove to you that he exists. If you are genuinely questioning whether he exists and want to discuss what my experience with him has been, what I think his revealed truths are, I'm more than happy to share that with you, but I'm not interested in convincing you. I, I don't, again, I'm trained, my background, my undergraduate was in philosophy and my graduate work was, you know, going to law school. So, you know, in some sense, I was trained in true, very tr different traditions about how to explain, how to convince people how do we argue? And I've come to find both traditions, while 
useful in certain ways to be limited and unsatisfactory ultimately. Um, now, I, I don't guess, think, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to uh, interject here just for a moment. Yeah, please do. You, <laughs> you said intent. Do you find that um, one of the things that we, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, that our intentions sometimes are to try to uh, convert just about everybody because we see that all the evidence that we have, there's no way that anybody could reject such great evidence. It's is that uh, prideful in a sense? And then whenever we, when that pride is broken, especially if you've never been on that mission, if that, when that pride is broken, that it, that it stops you from wanting to engage because you're so disappointed. Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I can't speak for the church. I, I am not the I was church. I talking about members themselves. Yeah, I, I, we can't speak, speak for my, individual members, but I would. I look I'll at speak for my personal experience. Right, right, what I'm right. trying to say, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it's applicable, but you know how far is maybe open for discussion. Uh, when I served as a full time missionary back in the early '90s, it was certainly the case that the the language as I understood it and, and as I un interpreted it we were going out to convert people, right? Um, and in some sense, to convert them to the church of Jesus Christ. That's not a bad aim at all. I, I don't... And well, as so a missionary, about, that's your job, is to proselyte and to bring bring souls not, to though. Christ. It's not. Oh, So, see, there's a... That's, there's that's a, the outcome. That, that's where I... That's where I that's what I began to learn. And maybe maybe I learned the wrong lesson. I'm open to being corrected. But what I began to learn was that as, what my job as a missionary was, was to witness and to teach in such a way that the Holy Ghost could change their hearts and invite them to come into Christ. It was my job to show them if they were interested and were listening to the Holy Ghost, what the path was that would allow them to have a more full covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. These, it, it sounds like I'm just playing with words, but it, it's important to me anyway, because I got very frustrated and almost cynical at a certain point on as a full-time missionary because I was trying to convert people to the church and very few people were joining in the mission that I served in, in the Amsterdam Netherlands mission. Um, you know, there was, uh, I believe at that time, the average baptism per missionary was one in the entire two years. Right? So you might work two years to have to see one person come to the waters of baptism. Um, now, for some people that there had greater faith than me, I, I suppose, and just that didn't bother them. That bothered me. I don't like doing the same thing over and over again and getting nothing, right? Right. Uh, I, I'm not that patient or faith-filled. So what I began to look around for was, well, what am I doing in the meantime? And what I began to see was I'm witnessing to people. Many of those people won't. They're not interested in that witness. It doesn't resonate with them at that time in their lives, or my way of sharing it didn't resonate with them. But a, it's not my job to say whether they have rejected the message. They simply didn't respond to the witness that I was able to give at that time and in that place. Um, the Lord may decide that I was the one that was giving them the best possible witness, and they, you know, that you know that was a good choice for them. I don't know. That's between them and Him. My job was to witness to that. My job was to try to create draw so that people would would be open to more but if you're taking a person who is not open and trying to convince them that they're wrong um, i just i don't know how you avoid 
that that seems to start from a spirit of contention. Whereas if you're simply saying, here's the truth, whether you respond to it right, wrong, or indifferently, here is the truth. I care about you as another fellow child of God. I want you to accept it. But if you don't, you know, I feel, I feel bad for you, not angry with you, right? In most cases, there are obviously cases where it's perfectly valid to be angry with people. The Savior did it. So, um, so I'm not saying you should never get angry. I'm just saying my response to it was much different once I began to say, I know this is true. I've tasted it for myself. You know, I'd love for you to have it, but if you don't want it. Yeah, I think, I think we forget. I think we forget uh, a lot of times. And I, and I agree with you. I, I, whenever I first got back into to the church, and I started to just, you know, try to, and I, and I was like, wow, this stuff is too good to pass up. It's too, it's too valuable. It's too, it's yeah. like, there's so you're, much evidence. You're right, by the way, you're right. You, it's, it's like, there's so much evidence. You cannot refuse the validity of what's going on here. And I went after people and I thought the worst of them whenever I started in on that so after a time i think it was, took me like a year whatever it was i finally realized that if you look at jesus christ and the fact that here's the master here's the guy that created all truths and yet his convincing power was as, as meager as anybody's could be he had very few followers and a lot of people just only were hangers on and they really only came because of the miracles that they were witnessing. And how could I put myself above Jesus Christ in the, in the, uh, in my efforts towards the, the convincing of people uh, in a, in a, in a uh, secular way and think to myself that, I'm greater than he. And then I figured, figured that out. And I was like, relax, AJ. If the master had no power over the convincing of people, then you will have a lot less. So do it because of the love that you have for God himself kind of attitude. Meaning just talk about it because you love love your father in heaven you love jesus christ you love joseph smith you love those things about the church don't do it because you're trying to fill in the the pews because i know at one time or for a long time within the church there was this idea that if we could fill the few pews of our church this was validating a prophecy in daniel which said that the church would roll forward or the stone would roll forward and it would it would uh, cover the the entire earth and we mistook that as the amount of uh, uh of this explosion in the church of showing its validity within uh prophetic doctrine in the bible and i can see then i was like holy smoke i'm wrong after uh, after the change of heart and all that because if you look at the other part of the message it is the elect who become and how can you have an elect unless you have a large portion of society not being a part of that uniqueness yeah can you follow I, that I, and kind of uh, kind of add to that sure i mean it's always tricky for me to talk about the church because if I look at what the brother and our leaders have said, I, th I think they have tried for many years to emphasize um, that what we're there to do is to spread the message so that those who resonate with it, those who hear the master's voice, you know, have an opportunity to hear, right? There, there are true seekers everywhere. Um, uh, now, 
they take prophecies or they take statements like the field is white and ready for harvest and different things like that. And they amplify it's, that, that, they amplify true, that right? to the point where uh, sometimes members and, and uh, within the church will say, well, we've got to fill these pews up because that's, this, that's what is, uh, you know, that is our trademark is to be the, 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 that place where, or that church that, like I said, eventually becomes so large that it fills the, the earth. But now that we understand it better, it's not that the membership is the growth, it's the places that we influence is the growth. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess the way I would see it is, is in line with what you said, but, but maybe a slightly different emphasis, right? Which is, first off, I'm, I'm always, I try to be charitable in my understanding of, you know, previous periods of history. Um, you know, life is lived forward and understood backwards sometimes. So, I mean, it's easy to say, <clears throat> oh, you know, I had a philosophy professor who wouldn't let us, I think I shared this, one of our previous conversations, wouldn't let us criticize the philosopher until we had understood him, right? Right. Um, and so, you know, I think it's the easiest thing in the world to say, well, we understand better now, so therefore you poor benighted souls you didn't understand in the past, right? Um, I, I don't think that's the case. When the Lord says the field is white already to harvest, I, I take him at his word, right? I think what happens from there, though, is we translate that into, well, therefore, if I go out and tell people to join the church, whole bunches of people will join the church. Certainly that happens. Right. I mean, look at Brigham Young's mission to England. Well, um, well Wilfred Woodruff and yeah, the, uh, so, Sydney Rigdon's congregation, and just so, yeah, there was a yeah, rapid even, growth in the beginning. Yeah, even the field in which I serve, the Netherlands, there were, you know, thousands of people who left the Netherlands and came to Utah uh, mm -hmm. to join the Saints there. So, but the the field. So number one, we have to take, as you mentioned in our priesthood lesson today, we have to take the time frame into account as well, right? So, so that's one part of it is are we accounting for the time frame? At the time that was said to Joseph Smith, there's very good evidence that, in fact, that happened. So that's one level of understanding that, that prophecy. Another is... Um, that, you know, if everyone in the church shared fully their love of the Savior with others, would we be like the city of Enoch, right? Where, the, and may, I may be misunderstanding it, but my recollection is that the, in the Pearl of Great Price, while initially there are missionaries, eventually the tide reverses, right? People are coming to Enoch, to the city of Enoch, the city of Zion, to see what's going on there, because they hear that things are different there, right? right. And so I think that we can get confused between a particular program or method that the Lord has asked us to use at a given time, and his ultimate objective, which is pretty clear, his ultimate objective is to bring about the eternal, the, the uh, immortality, eternal life, of immortality man. and eternal life of man. Yeah. Right. And so why are we out teaching people about Jesus Christ and his restored church? It's unto that purpose. Why are we asking them to enter into the waters of baptism? It's because we know both through revelation, um, teachings of prophets and our own personal experience, hopefully that there is more, to be found more happiness, more joy, more suffering, <laughs> more tools for addressing that suffering and heartbreak through becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. 
entering into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I began as a full-time missionary to focus on that, interestingly enough, I was more successful in the sense of both being able to find people and discern what they might need um, and less concerned with whether I was successful in the sense of what were the baptisms or the numbers looking like. Right. And it wasn't because I didn't care if they got baptized. I cared deeply if they got baptized. Right. But not for the act of baptism full stop, but because that was their opportunity to draw closer to the Savior, to enter into a covenant relationship with him. Right. But I also cared deeply about their agency. And that that love. And Nephi puts it beautifully, you know, I mean, he he sees the destruction of his entire people. He sees their history at the outset, their thousand-year history, and knows it ends in tragedy. And he weeps for them and keeps teaching them about Christ, right? Right. He doesn't give up. He doesn't get confused about what he's doing. He doesn't reject the institutions. He has temples and the laws of Moses. But he knows, A, where it's going in that historical arc, and B, what the purpose and the value of it is. And so I think I got myself into trouble by confusing, and this happens as human beings, right? Whatever we measure, we will manifest, but whatever we measure, we will tend to aim at. (laughs) And so we measure the outcomes, things like conversion by way of covenant to Jesus Christ. And then those of us who don't, haven't really grasped the full picture, we distort that into, oh, well, I'm out here trying to get people into the waters of baptism. Well, yes, we are, and no, we're not, right? Right, right. Yes, we are, because we know that is the thing that will bring them the next step closer to Jesus Christ. No, we're not, in the sense that I'm not trying to do it in order to be a successful missionary in terms of the numbers of converts or whatever, however you want to keep track of that. And again, you know, as a missionary, that led me in some ways to rebel and think like, oh, numbers are stupid. As an older man, I realized the numbers are useful, right, as a, as a way of saying, huh, if we're influencing this many people to Jesus Christ, how come some of them, many of them are not taking the next step? Is there something I can do to not get in the way of the spirit? Is there something I can do better to teach with the power of the Spirit? But ultimately, I am not doing the convincing. Right? You, you, I'm not a believer that you can convince someone against their will by the force of logic. You can destroy their belief system. You can put them into a crisis. Uh, you can bring them to a point where they might go, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure I know what I think I know. Let me now be open to some other ideas. But convince them against their will? No, I mean, you can browbeat them and get a decision that they'll go along with you, right? You can get compliance, but conversion? No, it it requires the exercise of agency. It has to be a willing thing, which is why I think the power of Christ's love as expressed through his commandments, his ordinances and covenants, is the strongest thing in our arsenal. All the evidence does, I'm going to steal from C.S. Lewis. I hope I'm not misquoting him here, but right, reason makes room for faith. Right? Reason is valuable because it shows that faith is a plausible option. It's not required, but that's that that is, I mean. Reason is not required. Some people come to faith through instinct or feeling or intuition or the spirit. So I'm not saying it's required, but reason can be a valuable tool to making room for faith. Uh, but it ultimately is not equivalent, at least I don't think, as the basis for faith. You were talking about C.S. Lewis and how reason has to leave room for faith. But well, reason can make reason can make room for faith, right? Can make room. Uh, now, why would it, what 
what's the difference between can and and should? Should it make room for faith? Well, or, I, I guess I guess should is it doesn't have to, right? Right. Um, an, an atheist who argues persuasively for his or her position is using reason to. I don't want to say undercut, but they're definitely not using reason to strengthen faith, right? Right. Or make room for faith. But it's like, um, think of it this way. Um, Let's say that um, Abraham, to my knowledge, we don't have much uh, archaeological no- uh, evidence for Abraham and you know his at his time in the ancient Middle East. Um, were there to be some evidence for Abraham to crop up, that makes it more plausible to believe in Abraham, right? Right. But it's it's not the foundation because just as likely science might come along and say, well, that was a bad explanation now that we know better, right? Um, and so, you know, it's entirely possible that the evidence comes to a point where it's tipping up against a particular belief at a, at a time, a, a way of life, or for at a particular time. What reason allows us to do is look at some of the evidence that makes it possible, if not plausible, to believe in certain things. Um, But it's not the foundation for the belief, right? I mean, I don't believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet because of all the evidences. I was willing to find out if he was a prophet in part because of those evidences, right? Right. But that's not the foundation of my belief. And so if some of those evidences turn out to have been over-interpreted or misinterpreted while troubling, it doesn't rock the foundation of my experience with the Holy Ghost. And so it then becomes a question of, well, how could that be true? What what did I misunderstand? And I have to revise and understand differently. Um, But if my faith were based on certain interpretations of the evidence, if that were the foundation of my faith, And I think some people who have unfortunately gone through a faith crisis have gone through it because of that reason, that that their reasons for believing were, in fact, their reasons for believing. And so if any of them are subject to attack, which many of our reasons are, all of a sudden the entire thing crumbles. Right. As opposed to, well, you know, I feel like I have this experience with the spirit that tells me that joseph smith is a prophet of god how could that be true right Right. well there are lots of reasons that that support and bolster that some of them come some of them go we get better understandings you know when i first got a witness of joseph smith as a prophet i didn't know anything about his polygamy i learned later about his polygamy and while it troubled me right it didn't shake my foundations because it wasn't the basis of my believing in him as a prophet. It simply yeah, was it, part of the room and the space that, that helped bolster that. So that's what I'm talking about. And I think something like that was what C.S. Lewis was saying. He was saying reason can show that you're not crazy to believe in this, but it, it doesn't go then the step further to show that you're absolutely right to believe in this. That, that, is, a, that is a step of faith, right? And so it, it doesn't get you all the way there. It simply makes it possible or plausible that this could be believed um, at its best. So there is, there's, there's some stories out there that say that, that the Messiah who was supposed to come when he did, when, they, when we say Jesus Christ did, or sometime, you know, the Messiah to the Jews was somebody who was never going to die. 
Right. And yet, this would be something that was taught to those who we call the apostles of that time, even before Jesus Christ showed up. This was their mindset. They see this, this great master of words and, 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 and act, miracles and all these things. They eventually see him up on the cross. Uh-huh. And you never, you never see them ever in the story or in the scriptures ever back away from that, 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 that uh, connection they had with him as being the Messiah. They, it looks like they almost said, we just don't understand enough to reason this out. But we still know through the power of God who this man was. And then, of course, well, he comes back on the third day yeah. as a resurrected being. And they say, oh, now we understand. this. He did not pass away for eternity. He only passed away for a moment. And then he came back as the immortal. Yeah. yeah um, I'm reminded and I don't have it memorized, so I'll just have to paraphrase it, but I'm reminded of a, a quote from Letters to a Young Poet by uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, a, a poet who, who said something like this, you have to live into the questions so that someday you may live into the answers, right? And um, I, I think of that, beautiful example you just gave of the death and resurrection of jesus christ and i i i draw some strength and value from contrasting the response of mary probably mary magdalene um to the apostles um and i don't think any of them were unfaithful I, i think but the contrast is um is illustrative to me the apostles are gathered together talking about trying to figure out what does this mean? What do we do next? Right. Um, Which is, I think important and valuable. I imagine, I don't know that the scriptures necessarily support this, but I imagine them trying to go back over the prophecies. What did we miss? Did we like, did we, does we misunderstand something like, how can this happen? Our leader, whom we thought was invincible, is dead, right? And what does this mean? And they're trying to make sense of it. I think no less than them, Mary Magdalene is trying to make sense of it. Her response is to go um, to the tomb to care for her master's body. Um, now I don't want to overread it. I'm not a historian of Jewish history, but I believe that was a, a woman's task was to help care for the body, but I could be wrong. There. Assuming it was, she is participating and making sense of it by doing something, by acting towards him in a certain way. And she then has the privilege of seeing being the first witness of the resurrected Lord that we have a record of anyway, right? Right. Is is him, is her in in the garden. Um, And I think looking at the whole of that experience is incredibly important, right? There were people who were trying to make sense of it by, you know, what does this mean? And there were others who were making sense of it by continuing to participate in the community. Um, and how important all through with the rituals. So, yeah, I was just, I was just reminded of something that was key in what you were saying. How important was it for the same people who seen the death of Jesus Christ also witness the resurrection? That's a great question. I mean, I don't know that I thought about it that way, but I think it's it just popped in my mind as you're you're talking about it. Yeah. Because if he if 
if he nobody sees him die and be resurrected and you only have a death and then a thousand years later he comes back you don't know yeah you, this is a man that you have no idea if he ever died you just know him as this being you have no connection to his death but because of that short moment that he's dead which is three days you know what i mean it's a it's still a short moment in reality but you yeah. have the same people who've seen him die put him in the tomb and then see him resurrected it's huge in that yes. in that uh that connection between the two yeah i i never thought about it great thought i mean i think it's incredibly important now that you pointed out um incredibly meaningful right that um, I've, I've shared with you you know I, i've had episodes of severe depression and though i don't know what it was like for those apostles and those followers like mary magdalene i I imagine it was something like what I felt when I went into a severe depression and all of the things that made up sort of the meaningful structures of my life were obliterated in many ways. I had to relearn a new way of living um, in order to sort of come out the other side, if you will, right? Reorganize in the face of that. Um, and... Uh, I suspect it was something like that for them, right? Yeah. They, to see him die, obliterated a lot of what they believed. And to see him rise again on the third day must have fundamentally changed the way they understood, as you said, the scriptures, the prophecies, their, even their relationship with him. Even Mary Magdalene, whose relationship, I think, is still primary and she goes to the grave to care for him and then he's not there and it doesn't appear that her first thought is oh he's risen that's what that means right it appears that her first thought is someone's taken his body right right and and then she sees him and what a sacred experience that is we don't we don't get a record of what's going on in her thoughts but can you imagine just trying even faintly to put yourself in her shoes? She goes, she thinks someone has stolen his body. She then recognizes the risen Lord, this person that she loves so deeply, right? She's there to care for even his body after death. And to, to see the level that that love must have come to at that point, right? So to have moved into, to realize that this, already love-filled relationship was even something bigger than she understood it was right yeah In that moment to understand that wow right so um i think part of what when we focus on convincing others it's not i don't it's i, I think about good better and best right yeah <laughs> from elder oaks right it's not that it's it's wrong to share in any way the truths that you found or the evidences for them. Um, and I guess if someone is convinced by that, that's, that's a good start, right? But better and best are found along the way to a personal covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And, um, and, and however you get started in that, you and I both know that Often that starts from great pain and heartbreak and not from reasoned argument. It comes from anguished cries of the soul of nothing is working. There has to be a better way, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's why the proud have such a hard time hearing the message of the gospel. And those that have been compelled to be humble, as Alma says, you know, often do hear the gospel, right? It's because what they're doing right now isn't working, that they're willing to hear if there might be some other way, right? Um, when I participated more actively in the addiction recovery program for our church, which I'm 
hoping to get back to here in a few weeks. But, you know, I was just amazed and astounded by the brothers and sisters there, the courage that they had, their willingness to say, um, this isn't working, right? And, and to, to face um, what would come next when they realized what they were doing and had been doing in some cases for years wasn't going to get them there. Right. And I'm, right. I'm always humbled to be with those folks and to be one of them, to, to recognize my own problems and how they're taking me away from Christ. But that first step is to recognize that you have a problem, right? Absolutely. That it's bigger than you and you can't solve it yourself. And, that is the fundamental moment of repentance. And it's often more impulsive felt after than it is clearly articulable, right? At yeah. the moment. It's not that we can put it into words. It's just a, sometimes an inarticulate cry from our gut of like, this isn't where I don't want this anymore, right? Right. And, and that is the moment where one becomes open not necessarily the moment in which the evidence has become too big to dismiss, but the evidence may lead you to that moment, right? right. It, it may play a role in leading you to that moment of, I can no longer discount this. Anyway, I, yeah. I'm rambling. Yeah, ahead. you're fine. Yeah, I know it's, it's not, it's, it's hard not to contain yourself when you're so knowledgeable yeah. there, but um and you are. Well, I, 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 you, I mean, you asked a great question, man. Like, it's just, this to me is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that it has something important, vital in the original sense of that word, right? Vitality, life, to show us about the way that we can be in, in a world that is increasingly confused and cynical and nihilistic. It says you don't have to. It's not an easy road, but you don't have to be on that road, right? Right. And that's what I think you and I deeply and profoundly share, separate and apart from, you know, some of our arguments about the branches and leaves. We share that experience of the root of the gospel, that Jesus Christ can give us a life that is more alive. Uh, what the In the older era of our church was called a life more abundant, abundant life. You'll find that phrase, right? And it comes from Christ himself. He wants to give us life more abundant. And I think you and I share some sense, imperfect as we are, that that's exactly what he's doing. Right? Yeah. That's why we want people to, to have it, right? And the evidences are for us just further witnesses of that truth. And for others may function as maybe an entry point into tasting that for themselves but yeah so i was just going to uh say that um uh, uh a gentleman we both know uh said well did you invite him the, the love share and invite and yeah. i said to him uh about another gentleman that had been um, um <clears throat> had gone to church for a long time i said i don't drag people where they don't want to go I drag them to where they want to go. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, because people just need encouragement. And also, put farther than that, it's, it's the idea that you, you become somebody that, is, that they can relate to, that they admire. Now, you want them to admire Jesus Christ. I get that. We want him to be sinner in their lives, but you got to have somebody, a friend within the church that makes that Sabbath day or that, that place where he's at inviting enough that he will want to be there or she will want to be there. Yeah. I mean, I think we all have people who we've come across in our, our um, covenant path, hopefully that, have invited us to come closer to Christ in some aspect. And at least initially they were the model for it. Right. Right. Um, you know, I've shared before that our stake patriarch 
lived across the street from me and was our home teacher for many years. And he was a man who spoke French and Farsi fluently, was the dean of uh, BYU's uh, English department, at least for some of the time when I knew him, played, I think it was violin in the uh, local symphony orchestra, was just a, a Renaissance man in many ways. And I admired that a man with that depth of scholarship and refinement uh, could also teach me profoundly from his own personal experience about Jesus Christ, right? Um, so in some ways, he became a model for me. My dad was a model for me. My dad has uh, was tested when he was in his master's program in educational psychology and you know, has a, like a 140 IQ. He's got a genius level IQ. Right? And yet he would teach me about the importance of covenants, right? So yeah, these people in our lives can be models. And it depends on what you mean by invite. Did I say certain words? Well, if the spirit prompted me to, I should have. Right? Right. And if the spirit didn't prompt me to, who cares? Right? The the I think the stronger form of inviting is come be part of the life that I share. Absolutely. That is okay. that is key. I mean. If you're enjoying, an... if you're enjoying, if you are truly enjoying that lifestyle, and you can't wait to tell people about the church, you can't tell, wait to tell them about Joseph Smith, you can't tell, wait to tell them about the Book of Mormon and uh, Russell M. Nelson, his greatness, and all these, and Jesus Christ being centered to all these things. Then how can you be inviting if you're not in yourself excited about? telling people about those things that you're excited about yes it, it's it, but, yeah it, it's like i'm more yeah, it, i see this as a problem we are distracted by that which is of the world more so than we are excited about the life we live as a member of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and therefore it gets in our way of our conversation it gets in the way of what we study. It gets in the way of what we are focused in. What is that? The, and I'll say it again. That which is at the tip of your tongue is that which you love the most. Yeah, I, I think that's, it's very ready to hand for us, right? If, if we love. I get frustrated with people when, when I hear all, oh, you know, I, I, because I'm so like, I can't wait to talk to you. Talk to you, Eric. I couldn't get enough of it today. You know, we talked for like 30 minutes. Well, we, my wife, I, know, I, I got you. Because, I got you in trouble with your family. Yeah, yeah, you know, so I can't wait <laughs> to talk to people about this because it's so invigorating. It's so live. And yeah. it, it, so, like I said, if I could encourage others to, and like I said, whenever we started this out, I said, are people afraid of a, a, a contentious discussion and that's why they're reluctant to, to even talk to anybody because they're afraid that something might go wrong. Things go wrong all the time in my life. Things go wrong in discussions we have with, uh, with other people in my life. It goes wrong with yeah. my wife. It goes wrong with my sons. It goes wrong with a lot of... It doesn't stop. But doesn't stop me from having enough uh, uh, a zeal in the gospel to say, I don't care that I, it failed the last time. I'm going to make it happen this time. And that's my, that's why I do so much of that I do because it's just, it's my life. It's my, it's my passion. And I'm hoping to instill in others that same kind of passion. But you, like I said, can't drag people to where they don't want to go, try and drag people to where they want to go. Well, and I, I think you, the way you just phrased it, gave me an important insight. Let's look at love, share, and invite, right? And I think those things are um, ordered in a particular way on purpose. I believe the brethren um, were deeply inspired in using those words. You, I think you've heard me enough times in Elder Scorn say that I don't like the words missionary work. Um, 
and it's not because I have a negative connotation with them. I think they're too small. Right? There's something you can go do and check off your checklist. Love, share, and invite has to become part of the fabric. What do you love first? You want, it, right? it, if you, like I said, if you love, if you love the story of Joseph Smith, if you love the story of Jesus Christ, if you love the fact that you are a child of God, if you find those to be love, that is the love that you have first, then it's easier to share that which you love. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, and I put a spin on love. Know. Because I know the love that they're talking about. I love your fellow man. But I think you can move that exactly where I talked about before. Love your father in heaven first. Love Jesus Christ. Love the gospel. And those you love the most will be at the tip of your tongue. Yes. And look, the, I believe, I haven't been able to find the source of this, but I've seen a number of Buddhists talk about the idea of fierce compassion. Right? And, and I appreciate the idea of fierce compassion, that, that love, we have boxed love in and to the point where, frankly, in our, in our modern day culture, love can only mean romantic love at its best and actually just means something like lustful obsession um, in most culture nowadays, I think even though I think most people understand the distinction between those, but there are deeper forms of love that ancient philosophers and Christians have appealed to all the time. We have brotherly love. We have Christ-like love or, or charity or agape. Um, we do have eros or romantic or sexual love, right? Have this kind of, um, there's a richness to love, and I include in that fierce compassion, right? Um, that is, I see that in Captain Moroni in the title of Liberty, right? One, one of my Kung Fu teachers, my Sifu's uh, heroes was, you know, Captain Moroni, uh, who, you know, basically was like, he was a no-nonsense dude, right? I mean, absolutely. His people were being attacked by an outside enemy who was bent on destroying their liberty, their civilization. Um, there was those who were within their society left and went and got yeah. outside enemies. Yeah. yeah, right. And and they come back and they come back in force and they, and they go right to the heart of the government, Zarahemla, and try to destroy them from uh, the kingmen. And you, the picture of, of Captain Moroni is often this sort of very strict, austere warrior. But yeah, but it's because of love, right? Yeah. The title of liberty is fundamentally a declaration of here are the things I love so much I'm willing to die for them, right? Um, and so I think my one of my younger brothers taught me that. I, I was a sort of... I've gone through different phases where I've been very cynical about patriotism. And I'm still a little bit concerned about it. I've seen it misused. But I was arguing. It was contention. I was arguing with my brother. <laughs> I was in law school. He was serving in the military. And we were arguing about um, flag burning. Right? Right. And I... I, as kind of a libertarian in support of the First Amendment, was arguing it should be allowed, right? Right. And he was trying to argue with me about it. He was getting super angry with me. Of course, and he, he may remember. <laughs> yeah, and I'm he may remember angry it with you too. <laughs> yeah, um, and he may remember it differently, but my memory of it is that I was whooping him in, on the arguments, but he was firm and very passionate about what he felt, and. It took me years to be humble enough to hear what he was trying to tell me, right? What he was trying to tell me was, my brothers in arms have laid down their lives for the ideals 
hypocritical though we are in this country towards them sometimes, but for the ideals that are represented by that flag and for you to burn it as some sort of political statement is to disrespect the sacrifice that was made, right? For those ideals. So it wasn't so much that he ever convinced me by the strength of his argument, but it took me a long time to be humble enough to hear the witness that he was bearing to the sacredness of the sacrifices, which was bound up into that symbol, that flag for him, right? Right. Now, we could, I think, today have a discussion with a little bit more distance since his military service about whether that sacrifice itself somehow redeems the act of burning the flag, right? Um, yeah, that's an but, interesting. That's an interesting connection. It really, because yeah. again, like you're pointing out that that idea that we are we the flag is more than just a symbolic uh, uh, symbolic to our nation. It is our nation. It is, it is what is represented by the nation, which is the freedom to act for oneself uh, short of, of uh, harming humanity within your freedoms. Yeah. And well, burning the flag both is you do not rep you, if you for me I'm, we're, we're not going to get in this subject i'm just saying when you said that redeeming yes absolutely because it stands for freedom it redeems the one who uh burns the flag but it also crucifies him at the same time by saying you're burning the very thing that gives you the freedom to burn the very thing that you're burning and that's word salad yeah. for, <laughs> for yeah. the ages there <laughs> yeah no no I, I i agree with you and it's hard to put it into words but you know if i were to and my brother might disagree with me in this way of framing it but if i were to put it into words nowadays i guess my position would be I think a free society has to allow the burning of the, the flag, but we don't have to respect it. Right. I don't respect the burning of the flag as a meaningful statement. I find it, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but I find it a juvenile way to express your emotion. But I think we have to allow it, right? What, and for the very reasons that my brother was trying to articulate to me, which is, you know, right or wrong, I, I, for example, I, I'm not convinced we went into Vietnam for the right reasons, and I certainly am convinced on the historical evidence at this point that we stayed there for the wrong reasons, in, in my opinion. Right, right. And so we sacrificed American lives and we'll have to a talk bunch about of Vietnamese. That. We're going to have to talk about that because people, I think... Yeah. That is a great subject. I'd want to get into that because I've got. Yeah, yeah. let me. Let, let's yeah, come back I think to... uh, I, because I think it's a great subject. Uh, we can definitely do that. If those who capture this video, we're going to talk about the importance of these um, of pawn or these wars that were actually about. Uh, uh, I can't remember. It's um, surrogate wars that we fought yeah. in America. Yeah. I think it's a great subject. We'll get into that, but I want to go back, but right back. Let's to come. Where... Let's come back to the flag real quickly. Is right, and and to Captain Moroni and go all the way back to where we were before, which is Captain Moroni with the title of Liberty takes a position different than me, and probably he's more correct than me, right? In the sense that when he raises that title of Liberty, he says, "Look, these are the things we're willing to die for, and if you aren't willing to die for them." that's a problem because it it goes against these very sacred things right right and that's where i think my brother had probably the better part of the argument 
even though I'm not sure he could articulate it at the time. And I certainly didn't help him articulate it. And so because I thought I was engaged in a debate and I was winning and my points made more sense and, you know, I, I could whatever argument he made, I could come up with some counterpoint. Right. It just got him more and more frustrated to me. Looking back on that conversation now, nearly a quarter of a century ago. Right. Uh, not quite, but yeah, almost a quarter of a century ago. I see that I was not engaged in a good faith conversation with him. I didn't try to help him help me understand what he was trying to say. We still could have come to somewhat different points, and I still think we would a little bit. I'm skeptical about the ability of some of our government leaders, for example, to do what Captain Murrow and I did. But I certainly am not skeptical of the ability of a prophet to do what Captain Murrow and I did. So I hold a slightly different position. But nonetheless, I think we could have had a, a dialogue about that. And I missed the opportunity to have a dialogue about that because I was trying to win a debate. And so, um, or even to have a conversation, uh, dialogue's an overused word in my, in, in my world. Uh, a true dialogue has to be between equals where we are open to, to being swayed and changed by each other. That's not always called for either, right? As a missionary, I wasn't there to have dialogues with people. I was there to witness to them what the Spirit has taught me so they could decide whether they were interested in learning that. But I didn't have dialogues with my Sifu, for example, because I wasn't his equal. I was there to learn from him, and he certainly allowed me to question, right? But it wasn't a dialogue. He wasn't, even though I assume he would say there were things that I brought up that caused him to think about what he knew and then teach me in a better way. I wasn't as such teaching him. Right. Right. But he was learning how to teach me from what he already had mastered. Right. And so he was bridging between me and him. So you were talking about how your questions might've influenced the mind of somebody who you looked upon as being a master. Is that right? Is that what yeah, but, yes, but in the sense that my question showed where I was and allowed him to determine where I was so that he could draw me upwards towards him. It's not that. And was he willing to draw you up towards him? Sure. I mean, he was a master in the true sense, right? He not only had mastered the craft of and, and art of Wing Chun, he was a master in the sense that I went to him as a teacher. And so I had said to him, I want to be more like you, right? I want to learn what you know. And he said, okay, well, then you got to learn kind of how you got to learn from me, right? right? It wasn't my job to question him. It wasn't a dialogue with him. Certainly there were conversations, right? Right. And, but the primary utility of those conversations whether or not he got anything out of it, in, in, to use our vernacular today, right, was that he could see where I was so that he knew how to draw me closer right, to right, his right, level right. of master. Because the first question I ask, if I don't know who you are and you bring up a subject that you want to engage, mm -hmm. you call it debate or discussion, the first question I want to ask you, do you have a God in your life? And how, if, and that's the first question, because if you don't, because there's several different avenues that I take in a discussion that that is the most important part. If I'm dealing with an agnostic, if I'm dealing with an atheist, or if I'm dealing with an antagonizer that is of another religion or what, uh, the very the various uh, people that I deal with, then that's key in my discussion on how I approach the discussion. I don't have a set kind of dialogue. I have a a uh, I feel my way through, in a sense, on how to forward the discussion and. 
for me, that has been very um, like one of the periods of my life. And it was only short, not about four or five months. I would go around and whenever I seen a random person, I would say, what does when I say the word God, how does that? Um, how does that make you feel? Hmm. Because. Again, I'm for one, I want a discussion. God is central to my life. So yeah. if I'm going to start that discussion, I'm going to I'm going to find that avenue. And I and I'm going to pick something up that I just seen that is really crazy for me and you, Eric. Do you see my light post behind me? Mm -hmm. And I was admiring yours behind you. It's almost <laughs> identical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not mine that's my wife's <laughs> so <laughs> same <laughs> so it's although she got it for me as a reading light because i can make oh, it brighter so, dimmer yeah. or move it around so yeah oh, wow but yeah so that is the approach that uh, again it's i'm trying to help people out by doing these videos i'm trying to help them become better prepared to, be, to enable themselves to go out and approach people of various walk, walks of life and say, I want to have this meaningful discussion and not get into a situation of, of, of contentious, contentious argument. A lot of times I get some backlash in our, in our meetings sometimes about, oh, AJ's just out there trying to, you know, win battles and stuff like that. And yeah, I know yeah. that that's the what they're reading into what I'm saying. But what I'm really saying is you don't have to debate. You don't have to get in contentious, contentious arguments. If you go very well equipped, very well equipped. That means being very well equipped is having experience those times that they were contentious yeah times that that you were like put on the back you put on your back because and on your knees because the, what they said just made absolute correct they just like like wow what they just said was incredible and now it goes against everything that i trusted before and also without those times in my life there's no way that i could have been prepared today to help those people out that really need the help especially in these days because now i've created a dialogue i've created enough vocabulary i've created enough approach because of all the failures that i'm able to help others in a more meaningful way. Not, I don't look, I say, I call them my victims. It's just a joke, all right? It's a complete joke. Okay. Because the victimization is you're going to get engaged with me and dialogue for hours. And that's just the way it is. And you will enjoy it. But yeah. you will, you'll be victimized by my, by my, sincerity of wanting uh, something better for you as a human being, whether it's your relationship with your wife or your, I mean, I, I, the only reason I've helped so many people help drug addicts, help people with infidelity problems or any of those number of things is because I'm willing to engage without any intentions, except for, bettering their lives for the betterment of their family or whoever they're associated with. I have no reason, but to, uh, I don't have, I don't have this idea that every person I'm going to talk to is going to somehow listen to all my philo philosophical lectures or, or, or they're going to, to feel the invite of the church in them. Most time I'm saying to them, I don't want you, I don't want people to be in the church. I like the fact that the less people that are in, in 
God's kingdom, the more chance that I get to be with him personally than by myself. <laughs> you know? So I have, I, I'm very selfish and I'm jealous of everybody else. Okay. So I don't want people, but I know that, and it's, a, and it, and it just kind of opens it up to, so that they can understand that I'm not coming in there to, to change their whole life. Just the, just that small part of it that they are truly concerned about. And if we can do that, if we can go in with that, with preparation and with the intent of just helping somebody along in life, then it makes it a lot easier to have those open discussions with people. And if you get it, look, I didn't, I didn't ask for it, but a, a guy gave me a, a, just a way in, uh, a, a guy that I was having these discussions back and forth about the gospel. He's a apostolic uh, Pentecostal oneness. I'm a Latter-day Saint. Pale, uh, uh, whatever, however many gods, I don't care. It's, it's numerous. So you can see that there's kind of this back and forth. And then he said, he invites me to this Bible study at his church. And so the pastor starts in, he starts in on Mount Meadows, polygamy, and all these other contentious things. And of course, he started in on our plurality of God and mentioned a couple of verses. And I raised my hand up like, hey, I got to stop this right now because there's several people in the audience. And he said, no, wait till the lecture is over, then you can ask the questions. So at the end of the, his lecture, like, what kind of Bible study is this, man? There's supposed to be back and forth all day long. But at the end of the lecture, I got a chance to engage in a discussion. Mm. And if I don't, if I, if, if, if that moment that I was feeling like this is going to go wrong at any time during his lecture, the way he was beating down the church at every, I could have walked, got up, just casually walked out and say, I'm not going to listen to it anymore. And every one of those people that knew that I was from the church of Jesus Christ would have been affected in a negative way because that man was allowed to say whatever he wanted to say in front of that, those people. But because I was willing to stay there and then ask the critical questions, doctrinal questions, I was able to at least... Um, uh, say to those people that a Latter-day Saint is not a, uh, somebody who's illiterate about the Bible. Because when I get in these discussions, I only go with what the Bible says, because really that is the foundation of why I'm a Latter-day Saint and why I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ is because the Bible identifies those doctrines that are critical to the to what jesus christ church was and so like i said so i i have an advantage in that way and i use that advantage but again i've been in several different settings seven guys in a room at break guy starts going in on me for uh um uh, the fact that uh ask me about uh uh, the the Bible verse that says you shall not add or take away from these from this book, and I said, "Where's the list? Where's the list of books that is that explains to us exactly what books was supposed to be in the Bible?" Right at the time that John receives that revelation on the yeah. Isle of Patmos. Yeah. So what there, I'm saying, there are no books. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm saying oh, is because yeah. I was prepared. And I'll tell you right now, the, the Spirit of God helps me a lot. Now, no doubt he does, because I could probably just break my own back uh, by my own ignorance. All right. But I'm sure that he's like, hey, you got too much going on here. I'm not going to let you uh, fail too much, just enough to make you humble. He, like I said, I've, getting, I've gotten into these discussions with people. And I've been able to walk away knowing that I've impressed upon people's minds that we are not easy targets. And, and not, not to be boastful of myself, just say that is just 
I'm hoping that other people can get to the point where we could, that they can feel like we are not easy targets, that we stand for a truth that is undeniable. It's few and far between, I get it. But like I said, I'm trying to drag people to where they want to go and not where they don't want to go. And so, yeah. but uh, have you ever, I mean, I've had people stand there for uh, seven people. We were just, we we're at work. Kid, my work is my father in heaven's work. When I'm at work, I usually are finding people to help in their lives. I'm at work. And there's, again, like seven or eight guys standing there listening to the gospel for like 45 minutes. Just a, uh, what would you call it? A, uh, 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 just off the, off the cuff. Like we just started talking. And this is where it led. They were very interested in what I had to say, but I was influencing them. And, and, and they never had a question. They were just enjoying the conversation. And I do this all the time. It's, it's a wonderful feeling when you have that kind of, of influence. And if people could latch on to that one moment that they inspired somebody to better their lives, then it just becomes addictive. And you can't wait for the next one. But if you never had the experience or you've been told that that debate is contentious and you need to step away from it. And we're not. And that's the problem. Like you told me at church, you said. Debate is where you have a winner and loser. A dialogue is where you have. A, a very passionate. Uh, yeah, discussion. You can have a and you're going to have those times that are very passionate, but be able to walk away from that, that moment and, and to be able to come back to it and say, hey, let's have that, that battle or that, that discussion again, because I've got, I'm sure you've thought about it. I've thought about it. I have another little story real quick, and then I'll get you, get you in. I, I mean, I have so many stories because I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was barely getting my feet wet back into the church. All right. And me and this person that's totally just anti Mormon. I don't, I can call him antichrist because we belong to the church of Jesus Christ, but I want to be somewhat kind anti Mormon. So he's right. anti he's feeding me all the, all the things he can to, to witness me away from the church. Another guy had given me a tape of Walter Martin, who was a notorious anti-Mormon, going around the public, uh, challenging people to debates. He was debate. He was challenged. He challenged somebody in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, my in-laws know this guy, it's Brother Johnson, and Brother Johnson down in Southern California, Orange County, put him to task, put Walter Martin to task. And what happened is, and this is about 1972. What happened, this is actually, you can find it online too, the, the court hearing uh, uh, the, uh, on the, um, Walter Martin had sued Brother Johnson for defamation of character. He also sued the church at the same time. Hmm. And of course, the judge threw it out, but the, the, but the church did not want that kind of bad press. And from that point on, it seemed like that the, 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 the idea of having open debate had really become something that the church didn't want the members to become involved in. And because they didn't want people just suing us randomly. You know what I mean? And so now you transition that to, to, to what is going on. And what had happened is if in, in the 70s and 80s, or especially the 80s and 90s, you can see an uptick of membership too, skyrocketed because we showed our strength at one time. And that's what happens. When you show strength, you sh then you, uh, then might is right kind of attitude and people start to want to be, become a part of that might. Mm -hmm. but now that they stop that open dialogue and that open debate dialogue, 
and that was in the you know I was taught that we don't get engaged in contentious discussions or dialogue. Then you now look at the 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 wavering uh, of saints today because again we're so afraid that we might offend somebody that we're not willing to step out and step above ourselves and let the Lord lead us in these moments. Boy, I said a lot. So, <laughs> but I, I want to go back one one little thing. So this guy who was feeding me all this garbage, basically, I'm at work and the bench is an eight by four bench, uh, uh, workbench, all right? And I'm standing on one side and he's walking through on the other side, about five feet away from the bench. I'm standing right on top of it because I'm working. And he said that Joseph Smith was just a con artist who was trying to use his leverage against people to gain money and to gain uh, uh, multiple uh, women as wives. And I said to him, and this is the first time I really knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. I said to him, there's nothing you or anybody else can say that ever that would ever make me deny that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. He said no more, walk through the building as if, as if the conversation never happened. And a few weeks later, we were conversating and I started to engage again. He's like, I don't talk about it anymore because of that one moment. I said, I believe me, you don't have to worry about uh, me feeling like you stepped over the bounds. It's just something I needed to say at the time. And we did. And then we were able to start back in to that conversation again. You're going, yes. And because I showed strength at that moment, and I was very, and he was very aware of that strength. It basically shut him down and it was a, a testimony but for him it felt contentious but for me it felt like okay final final statement then like i said it took us a couple or three weeks to get back into that discussion but i wasn't scared off by the idea that this guy was going to start beating down on me again about things he just knew where i stood and a pre a, a uh, uh, respected my position, even though that he was still against what I believed. Okay, I said a lot. No, I mean, I, I think that's probably, I think it's a great story to end on because what you'll see there was it wasn't a debate, right? But he, he kept trying to engage you in a debate. Let me tell you all these facts about Joseph Smith, right? That's great. I mean, there are some of those facts that float around in that world are made up. Um, some are taken out of context and some are true. Um, the, if you had engaged him in a debate, you would have been saying, well, this isn't true and that's not true. You guys would have been arguing about whose evidence was better, right? Which is a, it's, it's a perfectly valid thing to do but it will draw no one to Christ. At best, it allows the room for someone to be drawn to Christ. For some one of your coworkers to say, well, that guy's saying crazy stuff, but AJ said, no, that's not how this works. It's not how that works. And AJ seems to be pretty calm about this, right? I mean, you know, you've had enough street experience that one way you can win a fight, it doesn't work for everybody, but one way you can win a fight is a guy to get so angry, right? That he overcommits to his positions when you're in a fist fight, right? Um, I see contention the same way, right? Contention then puts blinders on us because we now become all about winning this particular argument and not about drawing closer to Jesus Christ, inviting others to do the same, right? Now, again, does it mean... I like what Elder Bednar once said in a talk he gave on meekness, you know, meekness is not weakness. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, think of Gandhi on the salt marches, right? When they were going to the ocean, making salt, which was illegal and they were getting beaten. The people that would step up would just get brutally beaten. And the next person in line would just step up and get beaten. Right. There is a form of moral authority that comes from, 
a willingness to quietly have anger, um, even physical harm sometimes inflicted on you, right? That calls into question the moral authority of the ones inflicting the anger. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. used that in a, in a I think, a, a very intentional and a very profound way. Um, I am not myself a pacifist, but I admire those who, from a position of strength, chose to be pacifists, right? I mean, somebody that I deeply respect once said, you know, that if you can't do otherwise, in other words, if you can't uh, defend yourself, the choice not to defend yourself is not heroic. Right? So the choice to get beat up if you don't know how to defend yourself is just it's not really a choice. You got beat up. Right? But if you can defend yourself and you choose not to because the spirit restrains you, well, that's a deeply, if you will, heroic, admirable thing to do. Right. right? As yeah. is the choice to defend yourself if the spirit prompts you to do it. So, you know, ultimately what it comes down to is I don't think the spirit's ever going to prompt you to contention but it might prompt you to bear witness against something I, in fact not might it will at times in your life right absolutely stand I know that up one. and say something <laughs> very unpopular right which may be read as i'm picking a fight with you but it's not it's it's here's the truth right like if you, you know and usually the people that scream loudest that you're picking a fight with me are the ones who were trying to pick a fight like, uh, you know, Joseph Smith said, hit pigeons flutter. Okay? Nephi said, I think it was Nephi, the wicked seemeth, take it the truth to be hard. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay? It doesn't mean that the truth doesn't sometimes hurt us. I had a bishop say to me one time, and he's a good friend of mine, and I, I have great respect and care for him. But you know, he said to me, he's like, you know what the problem is, Eric? You're the smartest guy in the room, and you never let anybody forget it. Right? <laughs> that was i would agree with him <laughs> not that you that was no a, i think you're the smartest man in the room uh, at least in no this room. no but it was very <laughs> unpleasant to feel and to hear i didn't want to hear that but he felt prompted to share that with me and i i would like to believe though i'm still imperfect at it that 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 was a very important thing for me to hear at that time so that I could learn how to be more meek, humble, and listen to the spirit. And therefore, as you said, to be of more service, right? And so, you know, he called me out when I, you know, I didn't want to be called out. It wasn't pleasant, but it taught me something very important. And as you say, we have come to a place in our society where, to call one another out is seen as contention where I, it, it is possible to disagree firmly, but respectfully. Right. 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 Absolutely. And I, you know, I, 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 again, I have two colleagues at work who I disagree with their atheism. They disagree with my belief in God. And in particular, they're not fond of our church. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But I don't take offense when they come at me because technically I don't feel they're coming at me, right? I, I feel like they're probing with their thoughts about how the world works. And I'm very interested in learning how they think the world works. And I'm interested in sharing with them how I think the world works based on what I think God has revealed and and my limited experience. And, you know, that's great. I'm, I'm perfectly open to that conversation with them, right? And not because I believe I'm going to sway them from their atheism, but because I'm genuinely interested in how, you know, I, I respect both of these men. They have to both be men. I respect their intelligence. They're both highly intelligent both very articulate they're very quick on their feet more so than i am um and i just enjoy learning and listening even though i don't agree with some of their conclusions or even some of their rationales right right 
and I'm willing to say, well, here's what I believe and here's why, right? And they've often asked me really good questions that I have to think about for a while. Yeah. Um, and also because that's how you get deeper into, back. that's how yeah. you get deeper is yeah. by those moments that make you dig deeper. It's, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I described it this way uh, is when you, the best way to lay a foundation is to dig deep. And when yeah. that foundation is either shaken, broken, or, or disrupted, then guess what? But guess what? You didn't hit bedrock when you were laying that foundation. You get down to bedrock. It's a ways down there. But there's where you will never get shaken. And yeah. in, a, in, a, in a gospel sense, it is that, that one moment that you absolutely know that you've heard God's voice. Yeah. The problem with that is, it's like this. I, I, you know, for myself, I think to myself, and I pray mightily, Father, I know you are there. You cannot deny yourself to me. Can you show me? Can you come here and give me a hug? I want that one moment where you just give me a hug. Does he do it? I'm glad he doesn't. In a lot of ways. Because Satan attacked Joseph Smith. Why? Because he validated our father in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. he, he attacked every prophet and apostle to the to the highest uh, um, to the highest degree of of just the worst kind of death. Peter, James, John, all those guys had died in a gruesome way. I can't remember which one it was, but one of the apostles actually got chopped up into little bits. Yeah, I, I don't mean, remember the details. Yeah, it, that, I yeah. mean, you look at the reports of what happened to these guys. Peter, of course, hung upside down on the cross and all these yep. different things. When you have that kind of witness, Satan is not going to lie quietly aside. So again, God is protecting us by not giving more than we can handle. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he's absolutely protecting us. Um, By not showing himself. But because the you and I have both. Yeah, yeah, because the expectations are are severe, meaning you look at the, I think we've talked about this before, but I'll mention it again. You look at the Israelites at the days of Moses and when he was performing all these, and then God calling Israel to the mount where he was at, and they were like, no, I don't want that. But because of all that, you can see how much you, you fiery serpents and the, the plagues that were upon uh, the Israelites and the death and starving, all of that stuff. So don't ask for what, for something that you would hate later. Because, yeah, it is we're, we're often mistaken about what we, yeah, what we really want and are capable of handling, right? Right. So, yeah, I agree. And I think it's a good point for us to kind of wrap up. Oh, absolutely. You, I mean, I really like your story because, I mean, yes, you stood up and you were counted, but you didn't engage in an argument with him. You just said, look, I, I know Joseph Smith is a prophet. You can't convince me otherwise because of the witness I have from God. Right now. Some would hear us say that and say, well, you're not rational, you know, okay. I mean, I guess if what rationality means is I must always be open to your evidence and cannot be firmly persuaded by the balance of God's evidence, then yeah, okay. I'm not playing by those rules. I, I take that criticism, right? But that isn't my goal. <laughs> yeah. My goal is not to get your praise for how rational I am. My goal is to try to follow my Heavenly Father and my Savior, Jesus Christ, 
through the path that they have laid forward for me, right? And that includes the use of reason and rationality, but rationality is not the end all be all. God did not say, Moses 139, this is my work and my glory to create the perfect logical Spock like <laughs> being, right? Right. He said, This is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Reason, evidence, these are tools and they're incredibly important. Um, but so is the sense of of belonging to to God. So is the so is the sense, though again, it is capable of being abused by nefarious people, but the, the sense of purpose and meaning that come as one studies the scriptures, right? But I think that the advocates for rationality always have the assumption that rationality can never be hijacked by a bad actor. And in the long term, that may or may not be true. It certainly isn't true in the short term. Right, right. Um, and so I think you know, that's part of what we come to the table, you and I, believing is rationality is good. It's fun. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, but at the end of the day, it's in the service of some truths that have been revealed to us, right? And, it, you know, if you want to come after me over those truths, you're going to get to a point where the bedrock of those truths is that God revealed them to me, right? Right, right. And if you say, no, he didn't, I say, prove it. You don't. Oh, I don't even say prove it. I'm just like, <laughs> okay, well, the conversation's done. Right. right? Like, it, we've reached the point where I can say, yes, I had this experience, and you who were not there say, no, you did not, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, you're now bringing in presuppositions about what's possible and not possible. I get it, right? But we're now, we're at the point of an impasse in this conversation where you who were not there, not experiencing what I experienced. Now you can say, Eric, I believe that you believe that, but I'm going to give a different interpretation of that event. Here's the way I would interpret it, right? Right. And at that point, again, we'll say, well, yeah, that's interesting, right? That's an interesting theory. Doesn't square with my experience of it, right? Uh, it's like, again, one of my colleagues at work likes to argue against free will. And I say, look, you may or may not be right philosophically. Uh, you know, he and I, I'm, I don't believe in absolutely unfettered free will for reasons we can talk about right. later. So we're actually pretty close on some subjects. But he's like, at the end of the day, I just think we're mistaken that we have free will. And I say, well, there's no way to tell the difference between you and me, right? Yeah. I'm just because, letting you know we got like four minutes to. Yeah. This last so I'll, I'll, I'll just finish up here, right? At that point in the conversation, I say, well, it looks to you and me. We experience the world as if we do have an ability to choose. You're arguing on the basis of certain scientific presumptions that that ability to choose is actually kind of a, a visual, an illusion, right? Right. I said, okay, I mean, I, you can't prove that. I can't prove against it. What I'm saying is I experience it that way. So let's learn how to deal in a world where we experience it that way, right? Right. And I even say to him, like, you act that way in the world, dude. When you get angry with other people because they don't live up to your standard, if you are truly a determinist, what's your anger for? They couldn't have done any differently than they did. Why are you angry at them? Yeah, that, that's true. I had that right? discussion. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I just wanted to point out. Just I'm going to end it on this one. Yeah, um, it was. It's kind of interesting in my own life. I did get a witness of Joseph Smith repeatedly over the years, uh, from whenever I started getting engaged. Um, and like I said, it was around 31, 32 years old. I was out of the church since I was 17, and I never was in the church. All right, it just yeah, you know, I never really filled that role. But it's kind of interesting that I really didn't get a full measure of the witness of the Book of Mormon for about 15 years, even after Joseph Smith 
was confirmed to me of being a prophet of God. God knows I'm lazy. <laughs> he would have said, he, it's like I would have never engaged in the kind of study that I need to be an influence on others and, uh, if he would have provided me the answer in the beginning. I would have been lazy about it and sure. said, well, God's already told me that he that it's true. So why do I need to know about Nahum? Why do I need to know about the, uh, the uh, Frankincense uh, Trail? Why do I need to know about... Um, uh, uh, the the fact that we have horses in the Americas before Columbus, and we have mammoth, uh, a mammoth graveyard, you know, no more than ten miles away from me, and all these speculations that were driven by the Book of Mormon because I knew what the Book of Mormon said, I was able to I'm able to take that information and say, look, in your secular mind. Here's the evidences. Where does Joseph Smith get these from his wee bit of information he had back then? I've been given that witness 15 years later after because yeah. it allowed me to, to learn the book first and then get that witness. Because the other way, I would have been lazy and I would have never engaged in this kind of, uh, of uh, study that I need to. Because I hate reading. And I and I and I hate uh, and, and studying, uh, you know, so, yeah, absolutely. So yep. it's that way. Uh, so we need to read. We need to study. We need to write down what we've learned so that we can kind of articulate out on paper. When we go out, then it's a lot easier for us to recover what we've learned because we've written it down. And then. So I'm sorry to drag this on, uh, but I just wanted, like I said, I just wanted to articulate that last point. The that, point. Uh, and it's the, that the reason that we cannot be idle about the necessities of prayer, meditation, and, the, the, and study. Can't be lazy about it. We cannot be lax about it. But the only reason that we'll want to study and engage in meditation and deep thought is because it has a purpose. Yep. So if you're not out there teaching people about the gospel, you're never going to have any reason to have yeah. a deep study. And, there, and I'll tell you right now, the Lord has no reason to give you revelation. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a great point. Um, to end on, which is, look, I'll, I'll, let you finish day, it. I'll let you finish. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think at the end of the day, the key witness that we're searching for is the witness of Jesus Christ as our Savior and Redeemer, that he lived, that he died, was resurrected on the third day, that he was crucified for our sins, right? That he has redeemed us, um, has overcome original sin and, and the effects of the fall, if we can turn to him in daily repentance as, as our prophet, as President Nelson has taught us. The rest of those witnesses are, you know, you were searching to understand the truth of the Book of Mormon. But when we say that, I think what we're really saying is, is this in fact a book of scripture that Jesus Christ wants me to use to know about him and to draw closer to him? And this comes full circle to our first part of the conversation, right? I'm not there to baptize people, though that is the function as long as they're willing to be converted to Jesus Christ. That is the ordinance, right? I'm there to try to invite people to draw closer to Jesus Christ through the covenant path. Why does it matter if they know about the Book of Mormon? Because it's another witness. It teaches so much about the atonement of Jesus Christ. In its pages, it, it teaches us many things about how to draw closer to him that are not plain and evident in the Bible. When you know them, you can go back and find traces of them in the Bible, right? So it is another witness of Jesus Christ. Why is the Bible so important? Because it is a witness of Jesus Christ, right? These are things that, you know, why is Joseph Smith important? Because it shows us something about the nature of God, how God wants to reveal himself and who he is, right? And what he told us to do in these latter days. 
But at the core, at the center of all that is Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father, right? And so what we're doing, as you are learning about the Book of Mormon, right, you're learning about, in part, why the book is so valuable, why it ought to be believed so deeply, right? That it, in fact, is a witness from Christ, that it is about a real people, that, you know, it's highly implausible that Joseph Smith could have gotten all those things right with the frontier education, even with the top-notch education at that time. Yeah, absolutely. So I take as, as given that the evidences are sincere and valuable, but at the end of the day, they're unto a specific purpose, which is what you just said. That purpose is that we might come to know uh, our Savior Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father in their covenant path and their restored priesthood authority more fully. So... All right, Eric, I, I think I can go on for a couple of hours more, but uh, to give you with me a break and to give our audience a break, absolutely. We'll just end it there, and we appreciate uh, you coming on. And uh, I know that Brad uh, Stone wants to uh, join us at, uh, in the future, so uh, I can't awesome. wait for that moment. There's a, another uh, uh, kind of... Um, um, uh, 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 character or a character in our our discussion here, you can bring a little bit yeah. of, of uh, that uh, flair also. Much much funnier than I am. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to yeah, say. He's got a great. We need, quick we wit. need a comedian. Yeah. We don't have one. Uh, yeah, he's, he's got a great quick wit. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, again, uh, Eric, uh, we'll, we'll join you again uh, as soon as we can, and we'll just uh, we have a lot more discussions to to get into because we haven't even really got into uh, theology yet. And there's so much that we have yeah. uh, to offer to our audience that uh, uh, would, you know, be entertained or be enlightened. And remember that uh, one cannot be enlightened unless the spirit enlightens you. Yep. Very good. We well, have a good one, Eric. Great. All right. You too, brother. Thanks. Right. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Your hearts will swell.